If you're interested in space travel and who's not looking for a way to get off the planet at this point, then you've probably heard that time doesn't pass for light or that time stops when you reach the speed of light or something like that. What sense does this make? I think I can help. This video comes with a quiz that lets you check how much you remember. The idea that time doesn't pass for light is an interpretation of Einstein's theories of special and general relativity. Yes, that guy again. Both of these theories are based on the insight that time is a coordinate and must be joined with the three dimensions of space to a four-dimensional space-time. The other key ingredient is that the speed of light in vacuum is always the same. The key to understanding Einstein's theories is that they have two different notions of time. The one is the coordinate time, the other one is the personal time, which is different for each observer. The easiest way to see the difference is to draw a diagram. Unfortunately, last time I checked, YouTube didn't support four-dimensional graphics. So this is why we'll make do with just one dimension of space that we draw on the horizontal axis and time on the vertical axis. This is called a space-time diagram. In this space-time diagram, the motion of an observer who just sits still is described by a vertical line. That of an observer moving at constant velocity is a straight line at some angle to the vertical. By convention, the speed of light is at a 45 degree angle. The curve on which an observer moves in a space-time diagram is called the world line. Now about these two notions of time. The time axis in this diagram measures what we call the coordinate time. That could, for example, be the time in your bedroom with zero marking midnight on Tuesday. It's a convention, like it's convention to measure location on Earth by latitude and longitude, and longitude zero is in a place called Greenwich. But this coordinate time is physically meaningless because anyone could pick a different one, like there's nothing preventing you from picking a time coordinate that looks like this. It's just that it would be very cumbersome. The physically meaningful time is the time that passes for an observer. And that time is measured by the length of the world line of the observer, which I remind you is just a fancy word for the curve that he or she makes in the space-time diagram. This physically meaningful time is called the proper time of the observer. So the proper time is the length of the world line, which is the curve of the observer in space-time. To see the difference between the coordinate time and the proper time, consider I give you the coordinates of Cape Town in longitude and latitude. You can then say that, well, that's 18.4 degrees east of Greenwich. All right, but that doesn't tell you what it physically takes to get there, does it? For this, you'd have to measure the length of the path from Greenwich to Cape Town. And it's the same in space-time. If you want to know the time that passes, you must measure the length of the path. And this is where things get a bit complicated because the length of a path in space-time is not calculated the same way that we calculate the length of a path in space. I mean, look, somehow it must matter that it's space-time and not space and more space, right? If it was just space-space, we'd use what's known as the Euclidean distance. Suppose the two coordinates are x and y. If you have a straight line, you take the distance between the initial and end points in each direction, square them, and then you take the square root of the sum. In space-time now, you take the square of the distance in time, but subtract the distance in space. This is known as the Lorentzian distance. And that finally brings us to the question how much time passes for light. Let's ask how much proper time passes for an observer between two instances of coordinate time. Two instances of coordinate time are those two parallel lines. There are many ways to get from one to the other, depending on how fast you move. Remember that the faster you move, the closer the angle of your world line is to 45 degrees, which is the speed of light. If you calculate the length of this curve with the correct Lorentzian distance, you find that it gets shorter 
the closer you get to the speed of light. And indeed, if you calculate the proper time for anything that moves exactly with the speed of light, then the result is always zero. This is how space-time works. And this is where the idea comes from that time doesn't pass for light. Because light doesn't have an internal time, the proper time for light is always zero. The question is now what this means. Light isn't known for being very communicative, so we can't ask it how it's doing. Though, well, of course we can ask. If you're light, please let us know in the comments how you're doing. While we wait for light to reply, best we can do is try to interpret the maths. And my interpretation of the maths is that if you move with the speed of light, then everything along your path happens in the same instant. If you were to cross the entire universe, the entire trip would take a duration of zero seconds. It all happens at once. Maybe that's why light doesn't talk all that much. Unfortunately, we can't move at the speed of light. To our best current knowledge, the only thing that can move with the speed of light is, well, light. Light is made of the quanta of light, the photons, and those are elementary particles. Elementary particles don't experience time because they don't experience anything. So the question of what the maths means for experience is rather philosophical. I believe the reason that people get confused about what it means that time stops for light is that they don't distinguish between the proper time of light itself, which in some sense could indeed be set to stop, and the coordinate time that describes the universe we inhabit. Of course, coordinate time doesn't stop, and I hope that you won't stop coming up with interesting questions. Please let me know in the comments what you want me to talk about next. Science and mathematics are important, sure, but they're also just super interesting and a constant source of surprise. If you want to take a deeper dive into the science behind solar panels or neural networks or quantum computing, I recommend you check out Brilliant.org, who've been sponsoring this video. On Brilliant, you find courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. All their courses come with interactive visualizations and follow-up questions. Some also have videos for demonstration experiments or executable Python scripts. This really gives you a feeling for what's going on. It's both fun and easy to fit into a busy schedule. I've learned a lot on Brilliant and now even have my own course there. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It's a beginner's course and covers topics such as interference, superpositions and entanglement, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. Sounds good? I hope it does. You can try it yourself for free for 30 days, but make sure to use our link brilliant.org slash Zambina because that'll get you 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.